Welcome to this, the second of the video lectures for uh, microbiology class. This video lecture is on microbial growth. Uh, about the only thing that will be different this time is that, as you can see, I got my hair cut, so I look a little sharper. Uh, when we talk about microbial growth, we're really referring to the number of cells present uh, in, a, in a culture and not really the size of the cells. Bacterial growth is evidenced, as you've seen in the lab, by the appearance of visible colonies on a plate uh, or on a slant. Uh, or by the increase in turbidity or cloudiness if they're grown in a liquid culture. An actively growing microbial culture will become an increasingly large population within a very short period of time if the growth conditions are right. By understanding the conditions necessary for microbial growth, we can determine how to control the growth of microorganisms that cause, foods, uh, cause disease or food spoilage, for example. We can also learn how to encourage the growth of useful microbes in those we wish to study in the lab. The requirements for microbial growth can be divided into two main categories, the physical requirements and the chemical requirements. The physical requirements that are most important are temperature, pH, uh, and osmotic pressure. With respect to temperature, most microbes have a relatively narrow range of temperatures in which they can grow and survive. Most microorganisms that we're familiar with grow well at temperatures that are also favored by humans, namely around body temperature, 37 degrees. Microorganisms are classified into three basic groups um, on the basis of the preferred temperature range. There are the mesophiles, which prefer moderate temperatures, as you can see here. The psychophiles, psychrophiles, which are the cold-loving microbes down in this range. And the thermophiles, which are up here in the heat-loving range. Um, the diagram shows, this diagram shows the typical growth curves for the various groups. Uh, an example of how we use this knowledge in everyday life is behind the principle of refrigeration of foods and how we limit food spoilage. Bacterial growth is significantly reduced at refrigerator temperatures and is reduced even further at a typical freezer temperature. On the other end of the spectrum, cooking meat, as you know, to, you have to cook it to at least a certain internal temperature, usually around 160 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 70 degrees centigrade, which in order to ensure that most of the harmful bacteria have been killed. Uh, you may be familiar with some of uh, the microbes that can survive at extremes of normal temperature range. There are microbes that have, have, can survive and grow, albeit slowly, in the Arctic ice or in sometimes even in the hot springs um, underground at very, very high temperatures. Uh, most bacteria can uh, only grow and survive within a very narrow pH range as well, usually around neutral, about 6.5 to 7.5 pH. This is why foods that are highly acidic, like pickles or sauerkraut, are very resistant to spoilage. Uh, when bacteria are grown in the lab, uh, they often produce acidic waste products uh, that eventually interfere with their own growth. For this reason, uh, frequently in the media will include buffers, uh, which will prevent the pH from changing too dramatically and ultimately killing the bugs. You hopefully remember that osmotic pressure uh, is the result of, os of osmosis of water across a semi-permeable membrane. Since microbes obtain almost all of their nutrients from the surrounding water, the concentration of dissolved solutes inside and outside the cell can vary significantly, which can lead to the net movement of water into, or more critically, out of a cell. The two diagrams here represent a cell, uh, one on the left here, that is in an isotonic solution, where the concentration of the solutes inside the cell and outside are equal. As a result, there would be no net movement of water into or out of the cell. If the cell is put into a solution that is significantly higher in solute concentration, otherwise known as hypertonic, like a 10% salt solution, for example, there will be a net movement of water out of the cell. The cell wall, which is fairly rigid in a bacterium, as we saw in the last lesson, uh, means that as the water leaves the cell, the cell membrane actually sort of shrivels and pulls away from the inside of the cell, which can be seen here in this diagram. Here's the inside of the cell membrane pulling away from the cell wall. This actually inhibits the growth of the cells uh, significantly. Uh, turning now to the chemical requirements needed for growth, these fall into three basic categories. The major elements, trace elements, and then organic growth factors. Uh, hydrogen and oxygen are required for all uh, organic molecules and usually are obtained from water. Pretty straightforward. Carbon is the structural backbone for all the organic molecules and makes up about actually about 50% of the dry weight of a typical bacterial cell. Heterotrophs uh, obtain their carbon uh, from their source of energy. 
organic materials such as carbohydrates, proteins, or lipids are what the heterotrophs use for their source of carbon. Autotrophs can derive their carbon uh, predominantly from carbon dioxide if they're photosynthetic. Uh, nitrogen is required for all proteins, nucleic acids, the DNA and RNA, and ATP. Uh, bacteria usually obtain their nitrogen by decomposing proteins uh, current, uh, containing material, uh, protein containing material or other inorganic nitrogen sources sometimes such as ammonium, nitrates, or even nitrogen gas. Uh, sulfur is used to synthesize uh, the sulfur containing amino acids which are necessary for proteins and several of the vitamins. Uh, bacteria usually get their sulfur uh, from other sulfur containing amino acids or sulfate ions or even hydrogen sulfide in some cases. Phosphorus is essential for the synthesis of uh, nucleic acids and the uh, phospholipids found in the cell membrane or the plasma membrane as well as in ATP. Phosphate ions are predominantly uh, the source for uh, phosphorus for bacteria. Uh, trace elements include copper, molybdenum, and zinc ions which are essential for the function of certain enzymes. Uh, these are naturally pretty present in, um, in water and since they're only needed in trace amounts you don't usually have to uh, seek them out. Uh, essential organic compounds that can't be synthesized are known as organic growth factors. For some bacteria these include vitamins, uh, some amino acids and that they can't make on their own, and purines and pyrimidines which are used to make the nucleotides for DNA and RNA. We're uh, accustomed to thinking of molecular oxygen as a necessity for life. Uh, that's what we didn't have it on our list uh, as, uh, other than in water. But in reality, it can be very poisonous, uh, and very little of it actually existed in the atmosphere during most of the Earth's history when bacteria were evolving. Bacteria are frequently described, however, by their ability to use or tolerate the presence of oxygen. On this next table, you can see um, the most common description. Uh, we have first the obligate aerobes, which actually require oxygen for growth. You and I are obligate aerobes, uh, and they cannot survive unless the concentration is high enough. In a culture tube, uh, you will see this will be evidenced by only growth at the surface, as you can see in the diagram here. Facultative anaerobes, also sometimes called facultative aerobes, unfortunately, uh, can grow both aerobically and anaerobically with the growth being greater where the oxygen is present. So you can see the great higher growth rate at the top. Uh, obligate anaerobes cannot tolerate oxygen at all and will only grow where oxygen is not present. You see the growth at the bottom of the tube here. These bacteria lack the enzymes uh, catalase or what's known as SOD, the superoxide dismutase, uh, which are critical for the neutralization of oxygen uh, and its toxic forms you see that the obligate aerobes and the facultative anaerobes are able to produce those enzymes and remove the oxygen from their surroundings. Aerotolerant anaerobes can survive if oxygen is present, but they can't use it any more efficiently or not. So the growth throughout the tube would be pretty even. You wouldn't see heavier growth at the top. There's one last group called the microaerophiles uh, or microaerophilic bacteria that require oxygen. Uh, but only at levels below what that's normally found in the atmosphere. So as a result, you'll frequently see them growing in a sort of narrow band just under the surface if it was in a tube. So the growth patterns that you uh, observed in a tube of nutrient broth can tell you quite a bit about the metabolism of the microbe and can be actually pretty useful when we're attempting to identify the unknown microbe like we are currently in the lab. Um, culture media are nutrient materials uh, prepared for the growth of microorganisms in the lab. Some bacteria can grow in just about any media and others are more finicky about the contents of the media. Most of the media we use in the lab we actually purchase in a powdered form and then add uh, water and then sterilize it using the autoclave. As you know sometimes we'll add agar or agar to the media so that we have a solid surface to grow the microbes on such as in a petri dish or the slants and stabs which we've already used in the lab. Agar is a, actually a complex polysaccharide uh, derived from algae uh, that has long been used as a food thickener or in toothpaste and some other food products. One important property of agar is that very few microbes can actually degrade or digest it, so the, me the media will remain solid even when the microbes are growing on it. Uh, it needs to be heated to about 100 degrees centigrade to dissolve it, and then it hardens at around 40 degrees, very much like jello. The major types of media are listed on this slide. Uh, I'll briefly describe each one for you. Uh, you'll want to jot down a few notes as I go through them. Uh, and you can also find uh, more information in greater detail online if you need to. 
Um, first one, chemically defined media is one in which the exact contents are known, in which no extracts are used in its preparation. Uh, it's used mainly for fastidious microbes, um, which are best described as being finicky, you know, as they have very specific uh, needs for, for their nutrition. Complex media include the ones we've used, nutrient broth, also LB broth. Um, these actually have extracts from beef or yeast uh, and have, uh, frequently contain partially digested proteins or peptones. So you really don't know exactly what's in there. It's basically soup. <laughs> Reducing media uh, include substances that actually uh, facilitate the removal of the oxygen from the media, which are used when you're trying to culture anaerobic bacteria. You need to prevent the oxygen from being present. Selective media are designed actually to suppress the growth of unwanted microbes and encourage the growth of the desired microbes. In other words, to select for certain ones. These are frequently used in clinical settings when you're doing a, a diagnostic test. You're trying to look for certain bugs and discourage the growth of other ones. Differential media allow you to distinguish between two or more types of microbes growing on the same plate, so they would have a different reaction. Uh, certain types of microbes will have identifiable reactions with the media and other ones will not, which allows you to identify the two different types. Uh, the picture shown here actually is of what is known as uh, blood auger. Uh, in blood auger, uh, it's used to identify bacteria that can destroy red blood cells. So if you're looking for a blood disorder, the blood disease, you may culture it on what's known as blood auger. If the microbes can uh, destroy the red blood cells, there will be a clear zone that visible around the colonies. As you can see here, some of the colonies have clear zones around them, indicating that they're breaking down the red blood cells. If the microbe can't destroy the red blood cells, then there will be no clear zone. Uh, enrichment cultures are used uh, for hard to grow microbes. They may be uh, very, it's really a selective media that targets a very particular microbe's specific nutritional needs. Uh, we don't use a lot of those because they tend to be used only when you're dealing with uh, microbes that are extremely finicky um, in their uh, needs, nutritional needs. Uh, in the next little piece, we're going to actually show a, uh, there's an animation we're going to show you uh, on uh, microbial growth and growth curves, and after the animation, we'll look at in greater detail at some of the pieces. So uh, the next little piece you'll see are those uh, videos.